thanks again, Bill. I'm I'm usually not good with introductions, but I appreciate you speaking with me again. Uh, I thought I'd start with like a kind of a more generic question about like what does your typical day look like as an editor of Agni? Uh, like what are your responsibilities and yes, some of your like yeah key tasks. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm, I'm actually not uh, often asked it that way. Um, well, the beauty of editing, I've been here at Agni for 20 years and um, it's always different. So even though there are things that happen in a rhythm across the year, um, even when they happen again, they don't happen the same way. So, um, you know, for years and years and years, for, for more than a decade, I read for the magazine and um edited for the magazine never in the office always on the t or the, the train the subway in boston <laughs> on my commute or at home and that was because there's so much other work to do so there you know there's a lot of administrative work there are a lot of conversations that need to happen there are a lot of um there's just the the work of putting the magazine together i mean i i designed the cover and and you know, put together the art feature in InDesign. And we we work with um, Shuchi Saraswat, who's our senior editor, and I um, choose the artist with Sven Burkerts too. And, you know, that whole process could be very time consuming. For this issue, it's actually turning out to be very time consuming. Um, but but things have settled in, especially now that Shuchi and I are, are together full time at the magazine. Um, I'm able to do some of that reading for the magazine and a lot of the editing for the magazine during work hours, which is a real <laughs> bonus. Um, but, you know, we, we have interns and we spend a lot of time with them. Um, they give us a ton in return, but that's still, the, those tend to be days when I don't get a lot of my own work done. Um, a lot is happening, a lot is getting done, but it's not the stuff on my to-do list. Um, yeah. And so really, really it's hard to, uh, it's hard to generalize. I mean, it's, it's shocking both, when you work with the university, but also just working out with the world, you know, the, how much paperwork there is, how much, you know, you, you've got to figure out what platforms to be using. And is there a nonprofit discount? And, uh, you know, do, do you have to pay ahead for a year? And if so, then do you have to get an increase in your credit cards limit for that charge and all these, you know, nutty details that, that we all have to deal with in our home lives, but they get magnified in a, what is effectively a business. You know? Yes. Yeah. I resonate with you on so many levels. I've been in this space for like the last 10 months and we've been doing, thinking about exactly similar things. Like, do we get like an annual plan of this platform? And which, which platform? <laughs> exactly. So when you started out a year ago, did you think that there was going to be so much that not literary about running a literary magazine? Not at all. Uh, it's actually like so much work. And now I see like, I was going to, touch on that as well that we were doing everything just by ourselves as the two of us then we had a managing editor justine who's shannon's good friend for many decades i say many decades as if she's like 80 year old like for many years uh, and then we recently got a few interns which who have been helping us with a lot of like nitty-gritty like small things like social media or um website development in some way so i i imagine i hope that things are going to get a little easier for us because it just takes all our time and like you were saying you know you're reading on the t and whatnot we have been doing the same thing we get a lot of submissions and it's been very similar <laughs> so i can only imagine how it would be in 20 years <laughs> Yeah, we get um, about 15,000 submissions a year. Yeah. I... <laughs> and which, you know, and, and then there are some submissions that come by mail. So we have paper uh, slips for, for the and different levels of, of rejection. And, and then, of course, there are some that need to be passed around uh, more and, and get, you know, actual notes written. And, and so all of that is just a system. You, you know, you have to make sure that the office is stocked with envelopes and you have to make sure that the... Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that we've redesigned them often enough or, or recently enough, you know, because things change. We, we change if you change the price of the magazine or um, if you need to raise these days, shipping internationally has been just figuring out how to ship internationally right now is crazy. Um, and so, yeah, the, it's, it's endless. And, and I mean, boring to those not doing it. Um, yeah. But it's what, it's what allows you know, Oskold Milichuk, who founded Agni, he always tells writers that he thinks that they ought to spend some time on the dissemination of literature, that there is something about 
of course, engaging with other people's work, reading other people's work in that way. Um, but he also means that there's something about understanding what goes into it. You know, you, you go to a bookstore and buy a book and sit down with it. And it all seems, you know, you're in a cafe. It seems so easy, but it's very, very, very complicated. I, yeah, I really like this way of thinking. I can imagine why he would do that. Uh, I will ask a question about this eventually. But okay. before that, I like one thing that I'm always thinking is like, I think the basis of this question is a bit of fear because I am primarily a poet and a writer and and you are too, I've read your essays and uh, I've enjoyed them quite a bit. But I was wondering like, since you see so much, you like you do so much, you oversee so much in Agni and you're always busy, I'm sure you are. Like, how do you kind of, do you see prim yourself primarily as a writer or now a publisher or have those boundaries kind of dissolved and if so, how do you navigate and re reconcile these overlapping identities? Yeah, that's very interesting uh, to think about. I still consider myself primarily a writer, but I'm very, very proud of being an editor. And I think it's an extremely important thing. Um, I mean, not for everybody to have to do, but but editors are needed, valuable. Um, the work I do is an art. Um, we I've worked with many artists here at Agni over the years who are editor artists you know that that their their art is the art of literary editing and that to me is um you know i've sort of allowed myself to almost have a 50 50 sense of myself in that way um and and yeah i right now i have an agent after um, I, my agent died in 2019 and, and it took me a long time to get another um and that agent is shopping two novels but i you know i've written four or five novels and none have been published. Um, you know, what would have happened if I weren't spending so much time at Agni? But I think I can answer that, which is to say that I also, you know, spent years kind of barking up the wrong tree before I even got an MFA and I was writing. Um, you know, working at a magazine really teaches you what is yours what you love and what you don't love. You know, the, when you're working only with teachers over the years, professors, and you're sort of trained in what's good and what's not good, mm -hmm. but that has nothing to do with writing, right? It's like all that matters is what is yours and what's not yours. What, like, though that's a move that's great for this writer that I will never, ever do. I don't, it doesn't feel like me. I don't like it or whatever. I mean, I might love it in their work, mm -hmm. but but I I just know that I don't, that's not me or mine. Yeah. And working at a magazine, even though you lose a hell of a lot of time that might theoretically have gone to writing um, or to the administrative work of, of a writing life, getting your stuff out to agents, mm -hmm. you know, being engaged with um, sending out to, to editors at magazines. Like, on the other hand, you have your finger on your own pulse in relation to yeah. reading and writing in a way that I think you can't without you being an editor. <laughs> I love that. I, I love that you also started with thinking of it as like an it's an artistic kind of endeavor. And it is that I agree with you. I, I it helps me so much to just listen to this because I feel like I'm there and I want to get there even more. So I appreciate that very much. Uh, I also wanted to ask, um, so how do you kind of balance these aspects like do you kind of have, do you have a routine where you write in the morning and, or, you know, you've written like four or five novels, which is like fucking amazing. Uh, I've read excerpts of them. were amazing if they were out in the world. Yeah, <laughs> they will be, I'm sure they will be uh, at some point or the other, but like, do you kind of, I guess what I'm asking is how do you manage your time and energy between these two? There's one like more creative sort of uh, aspect and one more like a responsible sort of thing. Well, even, I mean, I have to be in the right headspace to edit because that's a much more creative uh, thing than so much of what we do as yeah. you're running a magazine. Um, but I, first of all, I'm, I'm not great at it. I don't know that anybody in the United States these days is great at work-life balance. It seems we seem to be the, the country on earth that's worst at it. <laughs> but, um, I mean, because there's such a sort of pride in being busy, which, you know, if we could knock yeah. that out of, out of everybody in the U.S., it would be a better world. Um, but I write at night and 
I'm like last night I was writing till three in the morning. Um, wow. I love night and if I can get going by, I mean, ideally eight, but, but 10 at night, even then I'm good. And I, you know, I can put away everything that's happened during the day and fall into the dream. I mean, actually the tiredness helps me because I, I get what I guess you'd colloquially call a second wind, but you, but it's because I feel like I'm, it's almost out of body. I lose sense of time. And I, you know, I think every writer on good days falls into that kind of, yes. Thing. Yeah. Um, and then tiredness doesn't matter what happened during the day. doesn't matter. Um, but if I get home and I know that a certain edit has to happen in the next few days or that I've promised somebody something and it's going to take meticulously looking over the corrections that have come mm -hmm. back from the typesetter, then I do that at night and then I lose my writing time. Right. Uh, you know, there's so many ways that you lose. Like if I, if my partner and I decide we're going to go out with friends and have dinner and alcohol and I come back I, I, after drinking, I'm, I can't write. <laughs> um, so there are all sorts of ways that that time gets lost. And I, yeah. Do I balance it? Well, no, <laughs> I have no, I have no magic answer. But, but you get enough days of writing, you think? Um, I think I, I think I have started to in this last year, but, um, you know, Shuchi's only been full-time here for a year mm -hmm. or not even a year yet. Um, and that shift has been huge for me. Uh, it's, it's a very different thing from anything I had in the 19 Agni years previous. I'm, I'm glad that that change has been like... Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this, here's one question that everybody kind of is looking for when they're, if even if they don't read the full interview, they kind of want to kind of find this, like some valuable insights that you've found in your two decades of working at Agni, something like, I don't know, like any particular challenges or rewards that stand out and by the way, I want to say, because I said it to you before we started recording, but um, so when I say Shuchi, it's Shuchi Saraswat, who is our our uh, senior editor. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody should know. She's wonderful. She's uh, such an artist at, in this work. Um, well, I mean, it's a it's a gift every time I have an exchange with a writer, I because they do what I do, right? Well, in my yeah. life, but they have come to an understanding of what makes their sound, what makes their creates their atmosphere on the page. You know, their sensibility on the page. How how they take what's in here and mm -hmm. make it feel like themselves out there. Um, and so, every time that I approach them with our suggestions the things that they say no to um, really teach me a lot, you know, because we yeah. have such, I mean, among the editors here, we have a lot of collegial engagement. We also have that kind of engagement with almost every last writer we publish. People say, oh, don't writers get their backs up, don't they? Almost never. It's the the exchanges we have are fantastic because, because people like having their work taken seriously at, at that level, like read closely and by people who are not trying to impose their own ideas on it, but are but are trying to say, okay, if this is what you're up to, wouldn't this do it a little more mm -hmm. more, you know, yeah. sharply? And I think um that for that reason, you know, when when someone says, Oh, this is great, this helps, this helps, I mean, that feels good, but it doesn't teach me anything. Right. Uh, maybe I learned <laughs> as I worked, but I've been doing that for a long, long time. What really teaches me is when they say no. And sometimes they don't have to explain themselves, but they sometimes talk about why um, they don't want to do that thing that they might think otherwise mm -hmm. makes sense, but for them doesn't. Um, those things, over the years, I've just learned so much about, about textures, about words, about the relationship. I mean, there is no, I'm actually writing the intro for the, for the fall Agni. Mm -hmm. And part of my you know, argument there. There is no such thing as literary excellence separated from all the other things, you know, our individuality, yes. our, our concerns, our cares, our, you know, our degree of, of attachment or disengagement from the people around us. All of this goes into the question of whether the thing that you read is deeply compelling. Yeah. Um, 
and obviously it could be compelling for me and not for you, but but still when it's compelling, when I would call it literary excellence, there is no capital L, capital E, there is no objective measure, but there's this set of things that I could probably convince some yes. other editors of because there's something going on. And it's not just, you know, it's not, it's not teachable, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> People like, can learn it. People can yeah. learn it. But part of what they're learning is they're finding themselves. They're right. finding themselves on the page. Yeah. Uh, which is part of the reason why Agni speaks to so many people. So many people love that magazine and like hold it in such high regard because they see the sense of your sense of literary excellence kind of passes through to the reader. And mm. which is yeah. great. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's and wonderful to believe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't say this because I've been published there, but because I've been <laughs> magazine for so long. <laughs> Um, next thing I want to do, uh, I wrote this down that um, you're like, like you've mentioned that you've been here for two decades, which I think is amazing. And so Agni has been dedicated to bringing readers together into the living movement, not as tourists, but as engaged participants. That's kind of your mission statement and something that's wonderful. But I was wondering if you would... As an editor, I do think that poetry is such a huge, vital part of the culture and how we kind of speak about things. Would you kind of elaborate on the significance of this mission statement and how it kind of guides your decisions and initiatives at Agni? Yes, and actually connects with what we were just talking about really well, yeah. because, um, you know, I, I do think that there are editors out there there are magazines out there that that want a kind of abstract excellence I, mm -hmm. I don't know how they find it um because i i don't think that we can get rid of ourselves as readers when we're looking at work um we bring our own biases and we bring our own you know positive kind of opportunities but but we're warping what we read we we are becoming what we read right it happens in us Yes. as we read it um and so you know if you read something the word that we use all the time here it's not in that mission statement but we use it constantly is urgent if if mm -hmm. you read it and it feels urgent mm -hmm. something has happened in that writer the writer needed to write it in some way at some level now there's urgency that you know connects to events that we've all followed right. the news and then there's urgency that connects to somebody's own life that might not be, you know, urgent in my life at all. But when I read their work, I feel that urgency, and that urgency takes me right into the center of their their way of thinking. Yeah. And so, if somebody can, first of all, find urgent need to write what they're writing, mm -hmm. and then find that that's one thing that's essential. But then also find a way to bring that to their writing to to convey that or to to get right. that bodied and dramatized with yeah. what genre they're working in um you know if if you don't feel that there's someone there as you read then the thing is by and large dead right it yeah. might be beautiful yeah. but it's chiseled in marble beautiful it's the kind of beautiful you know where you find a roman ruin it's yeah. gorgeous but it is not alive yes I, yeah, there's so much resonance that I'm feeling within myself. And as you speak, we, we speak about the same kind of things, this urgency, this aliveness. If you don't see someone there, then it's probably not going to get picked. Which is, yeah. so, so the key then is, is like the writer, I was going to say defines that urgency, but actually finds that urgency, right? It's not about us deciding whether a topic is urgent. Right. Somebody can say to me, oh, do you want to, so-and-so is such an important uh, topic right now. Do you want to see a story or a poem on that subject? I was like, how would I know? Do you want to yeah. write it? Do, yes. do I need to see it? You know, right. <laughs> that's yeah. more the question. Yeah. Now, yeah. This was going to be my next question, like what you're looking for, but you've already answered like what you're looking for when you read a poem. And uh, or, I, there's, or there's a way that I put it all the time that it becomes like cliche, but, but to me, mm -hmm. it's something so much. I mean, I, we always want to find something we believe only one person could have written. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that doesn't mean pyrotechnics. That doesn't mean, you know, <laughs> somebody's got this ability with the, you know, sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it just means that, that they're digging 
so deep in them in themselves that you know any any metaphor or any trope that they're using like if, if it's a story that's sort of shifted off away from their actual lives it doesn't matter it's still something that they're bringing because of a need and yes and they're finding a way to to convey something that nobody else would even know how to yeah to dress in that way you know it, it, yeah and i and i see what you mean that it's become sort of a cliche but as editors i guess we are all looking for that that piece of writing that nobody else could have written but that particular writer and yeah. well i that's a beautiful thing but i don't think that it's all editors at all i mean i think <laughs> there are a lot of magazines who mm -hmm. you know if they if they if you had addressed it this way i think they they'd agree mm -hmm. that they're looking for it if you get a piece of writing that only the top 10% of the world's most well-known living writers could have done, then they'd grab it. You know, like that, th this could be just like skill, right. this marshaled skill. Yeah. Um, and then they would grab it because they'd say like, how many writers on earth could achieve that? Yeah. Like, but but uh, that's I, not truly what urgency means, right? It's not the same as being skillful or yeah. Yeah. No, there has to be that other piece because you can be, you know, I mean, think about it in any area, like you can be a skillful fundraiser, but do you truly care about the cause that you're raising money for? Yeah. You know, you can be a good salesperson and you can sell people garbage. You can be a very, very effective writer who is giving people things that aren't actually true. You know, right. and that that to me is the huge distinction in all of this. It's right. fact doesn't matter, but truth always does. No, I, I appreciate that very much, too. Yeah, I, I see the distinction very clearly, too. Um, so I was thinking something. Um, I see that you since you mentioned that there are many, many magazines who would kind of pick that. And I see what you mean. There's also a kind of I, I sense in a lot of magazines, a sense similar like a similarity between the pieces they pick it becomes like kind of homogenized almost and there are a lot of magazines that say that they are looking for variation and that they are they want to put out variation but what they're actually doing is not following that statement they are publishing stuff that is homogenized that you is there variation up. among their editors i was going to ask the same thing that do you think that that makes that what, what kind of a difference does that make i see agni and i see that just the two poems put next to each other are just like so different from each other, just not by the way of look, but by what they're saying, you know, their voices and whatnot. So is this something that you think, I, I feel as if you are doing this very intentionally that there is variation within our, within our volume. That's interesting. Um, we're doing it intentionally, but, but you have to look at where in the process it enters right so we're not doing it intentionally by saying oh we've got three poems that work this way and we need a poem that works that way we in fact never pay attention to the variation among poems mm -hmm. if if a, if something we accept feels like a real outlier in some way that's like tonally uncomfortable in the mix then we'll publish it online we've got agni online uh -huh. and we don't set up things in issues there you know so we we can have something that just stands for itself but but no, I mean, the way that we have variety is much more natural and starts much earlier in the process. I mean, we have a, a diversity of editors mm -hmm. and we have teams that, um, you know, I'm essentially on all of them, um, not so much nonfiction. Shuchi is essentially on all of them, more nonfiction than the others, but she's essentially on all of them too. Um, and anybody is invited from one team to go to the meetings of the other teams. Ah. So there's no you know, hard line. We're having meetings of the whole staff uh, four times a year, generally three or four times a year, but only two of our full editors, meaning the poetry editor and the senior editor or the senior poetry editor and me, or, you know, mm -hmm. only two after all of our collegial conversation and engagement about a piece, have to want it for it to go in the magazine. So there isn't, and in fact, another important thing, you know, Sven Burkertz and I are co-editors of the magazine. We cannot be the two votes. 
Right. I can I can be one, but then if Sven wants it, we still have to get another okay. editor wanting it. So you know that that knocks away the the problem of the gatekeeper who says, "Well, you guys have done a great job, but no to this," you know, and yeah. and that that leads to sameness or tends towards sameness. Right. Um, and you know, if you edit by consensus, especially with a group of four or five people, you you get rid of quirk. You yes, know, because, <laughs> because you're, one person doesn't like this kind of quirky thing, and one person doesn't like that kind of quirky thing, and so finally, it's like taking a rock through the rock polisher. You know, by the time it comes out, it's nice and shiny and smooth, and yeah. and it will never cut anyone. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Yeah, just having read. We just recently got readers for our magazine, like just like first level readers and second level readers, and that alone helps so much of that removing that quirk. Yeah. 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 It's so too, the we don't, all of our readers are masthead editors, um, which is one reason why we have quite a few masthead editors. I mean, we need, we need a lot of reading power. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, we've very carefully chosen people whose reading and writing we admire. And so, you know, they aren't people who are just at, at the magazine for a short time. Um, they're people that, you know, we've, we've read their work. We've, talked with them about literature, we admire them. And and so they become part of what Agni is. It isn't about, you know, I, I the first thing I always tell people that we're just starting to work with, and that, that doesn't happen very often because people stay for years and years and years. Yeah. But, you know, like five years right now, uh, there's a large group that started five years ago, but there are quite a few who started well before that. Um, and then there, you know, there are a couple have only been here for a year. Um, and there's Isam Zine who who just started uh, this last month. So as as assistant poetry editor. Um, so I always say you want to be reading for yourself. You ah. when you're reading for the magazine, you want to be reading for yourself. You right. do not want to be reading for what you think any other editor at the magazine wants to see. Mm -hmm. because the people will always get that wrong. You know, no matter how well you and I know each other, if I recommend work to you thinking that, well, it's not my thing, but I think it's your thing. I'm going to be wrong. Yeah. But if I tell you like, this for me is a rare book. This is a huge thing for me. Then there's going to be a pretty big chance that that will, you'll at least see why you'll be interested to read it. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. I, I see like, for instance, if Shannon says that, Here's something that you, I think you would love. Right. Chances that what she loves a lot, I would be more interested in that. Yeah. Much more. Much more. Yeah. Because, because people have a sort of, they have an idea of what you like <laughs> that are, you know, among the things that they're not drawn not, to. And that is always going to be sort of, because they're not drawn <laughs> to that kind of work, they don't know the nuances, right? Right. right? That's the other thing we do in the editing process here is we always, when we're giving work to interns for editing, we say, if you do not like the story, if you don't understand why we accepted this, um, then you're not the right editor for the piece and please just give it back to us. If on the other hand, you really like it, but you think that all these things are gimmicky and that's, don't assume that we took it liking those gimmicky things. Right. And work it down, note it, say, you know, this piece is for me, but not that, not that element of it. I mean, I think that's, again, it's, it's all about making sure that people are engaging their full reading mm -hmm. selves what we all are above everything else is yes obsessive readers right <laughs> we all love reading so if we're there there's there are exceptions to this and they're very important which is that if you have a team out there reading for you and they reject out of hand everything that they don't like that isn't their just exactly their kind of thing then then we would miss a lot so we say like if if you read something and, and it's not for you but but you feel it's done with skill and heart yeah. you know there's this is a talented writer and they're up to something then please pass it forward say openly this isn't for me but i don't want to turn it down because i see something happening in here but you know d that's basically the only exception like yeah. don't don't pass it forward if yes. you think it's awful and poorly done, but somehow you think I'll love it. <laughs> right, right. No, when our, when, yeah, when our readers listen to this, they would like this so much because that's exactly what they do too, that they would say this isn't me, but yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah. I mean, that one thing, that, that one point is just about respect, right? You read something and you say, okay, I know my fellow editors, somebody here deserves to read this to make yeah. sure that it isn't just my biases that would have me reject a second person narrator, you know, like, right. you know, like second person narrators, but this is really well done. And there is a reason why it's told in second person. So let me, let me get another reader for right. this. I see I see how that that comes out of respect and yeah I also wanted to speak about that you publish like you continuously publish translations in Agni mm -hmm. and I want to know if that has always been the case and if you could speak a little bit about why you believe that it's important for poetry from other languages and cultures to kind of be read and reach a wider, wider audience mm -hmm. I, I, translation oh <laughs> oh, we could talk about that all week um <laughs> <clears throat> probably the rest of our lives. So Agni was founded by Oskol Milnichuk, who whose parents came to the United States from Ukraine. And in the first few issues, I mean, I, I don't have it exactly, but, you know, maybe even six or seven issues, there weren't that many translations. And in fact, there were no essays and it was almost entirely poetry and a few stories and then more stories come in and so um, it really wasn't until in the 20s, we're about to hit Agni 100, um, but but in the early early Agni 20s, right. um, when Sven Burkert, who was you know, a friend of Oskold's, when he, he helped Oskold bring in a large group of essays and they, um, and they started to focus more on that. And so over time, different things developed. Well, one of Oskold's interests always had been work from Ukraine. And, right. you know, he also, Sven, his parents came to the United States from Latvia. So there were people in the orbit of the magazine from the very beginning, founding the magazine, and oh, right. who right. Um, really understood what I think all, you know, writers should pay attention to also, which is that, you know, as with any element of our cultural lives, our culture that feeds only on its own trends and precedents and history is going to be distorted. It's going to be weaker. It's going to, you know, it's not going to be as sustainable. Yes. Um, and so we have always considered, I mean, Agni 48 was an all translation issue uh, already that far back. We just did the biggest, uh, it was Agni 94 when Shuchi Saraswat and Jennifer Kwan Dobbs, our senior poetry editor, did the biggest um, portfolio in Agni's history. It was a. It was called Futures, and it's uh, it's the subject of Futures, but it's all work in translation. Um, I mean, imagine if we weren't getting information day to day that yes. would only originally have come from another language, right? I mean, right? We would be stripped of almost all of our knowledge of the globe. And so how could it be that writers can understand what's going on in literature if what they mean by that is things only originally accessible right. in the language that they're writing and speaking um it it's just you know and and not only that but you know u.s literature right now it's been true for a long time but it's especially true in the 21st century is is a literature of many 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 cultures yes. and so part of what you're doing by bringing work from other languages is your bringing over a lot of the inspirations and antecedents that are already feeding American literature, but you're, you're letting that influence spread across a wider group of American writers, not only the ones that have access to that, to that particular right. pain, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's so important. I feel, uh, we haven't yet published any translations we want to, but we don't know how to begin and kind of how to go about it. There are not as many submissions, I would imagine, of translated lit. Yeah, you know, we do get quite a few. I mean, it's it's also hard. It's a it's a whole separate editing habit that you can get into after a, a while working with translations, where you can tell the difference. Oddly, I mean, it's mist feels sounds mystical, but it's not. Um, you could tell the difference between a something that's a flaw with the original work. And something that's a problem in translation. Oh, right. right. And so as as we're editing, there are all the layers of can we access the original 
author? That, is there a chance they would want changes that would actually represent changes to mm -hmm. the original thing? Um, do we only get to, like, is the writer not alive? Do we only get to work with the translator? And then we have to really work on being true. Um, that, is that is that translator, does that translator have the chops to be true? And is that what they want? Because, of course, there's also a more, um, you know, after the original work, a more... Um, a looser translation that aims to, yeah. to reach a different kind of truth of the original and not just right. a literal uh, account of it. I mean, we would never want just a literal account of it anyway. That's yeah. a more academic exercise. Um, and so there is there is a lot of complexity, but you know, I would recommend uh, to, to you and to any editor who's wanting to get connected more, the American Literary Translators Association, ALTA. Um, that's a great group of editors. They have an annual meeting where they're very receptive to editors visiting. Um, but also you can just be in touch with the with the leadership of that. They can help you reach translators and get more work from them. Well thank you. That is that is helpful. I'm sure I I'd look look at them right after this. <laughs> <laughs> Great. It's important work, I think, to bring bring up like you I think you articulated really well, so I won't repeat it. <laughs> but thank you. Thanks. Um so I'll come back now. I'll go back to what you mentioned earlier, and I said I'd speak. I'd like to speak about this later. Yeah. Um, so, you you've done an MFA as well, and so as someone you who works so closely with so many writers, what is your kind of opinion on the role of MFA programs in preparing students for careers in writing and publishing, mostly publishing? So, do you believe like MFAs offer a strong foundation? Or are there still gaps that need to be addressed? I imagine an, the MFA pro. Are you working with MFA students in 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 Agni? Well, so MFA students, they are interns during the term time. Yeah. Um, BU MFA students, they do not help decide what goes in the magazine. Um, they help us with with copy editing, and they learn the art of literary editing. Um, we're always the sort of intermediaries between their work and the writers that we publish. Um, so they're learning a lot and they're helping us with a lot. I mean, we we have renewal letters going out and all sorts of things happening that, that administratively that they're um, involved in also. Um, but editing is, yeah, editing already accepted work is the center of, of internship here. So BUMF um, is preparing their students really well. <laughs> what, what about MFA at large? So MFA, um, so I, I it was 13 years I was writing after college before I went went got an MFA. Um, do I regret that gap? I mean, I certainly wasn't publishing during that time. Um, but I don't think that it's necessarily what I learned then mm -hmm. that made the difference. It's it's who I was with. So if you have a community of writers and among in that community there are some publishing writers, and you're deeply engaged with them you might not need an mfa program i mean there there could be jobs in publishing that would uh want to see one i guess i i don't know commercial publishing's you know mm -hmm. demands very well at all um as you know almost all small presses and magazines i mean the editors are writers also yes and, <laughs> and so how do writers signal to other writers that they really have taken their writing seriously? I mean, these days in the United States, MFAs are are sort of the, the essence of that. Um, yeah. So it's partly a signal, a credential in that way. And it's, but it's hugely um, the beginning for me, it was, and I think for a lot of people, it's the first place where you find a core community that you then build on. You right. find those few people that you want to exchange work with who you're going to trust through thick and thin to save you from yourself, right. which is, you know, to tell you when this thing you think is the <laughs> next gift of God is actually, you know, it needs a lot more work. Um, and you also meet professors who become mentors and that's so helpful. Exactly. People you was writing you like. Uh, I mean, you... I had four professors at Bennington, uh, and I graduated in 2003. I'm still in touch with all four. Yeah. Um, and, you know, very much value their input. They, but the sense of community that do writing in isolation is like being a visual artist in isolation. You know, 
that it's it's it ends up being a kind of demeaning ridiculous thing but if you look at galleries and and museums like the people who didn't have other artists around them that's called folk art they're up there as like self-taught this and that it's because it's because they don't know There are all sorts of things they have to learn over time that could just be imparted to them very quickly. Yes. And so they end up, and I did for many years, I it was me, you know, missing really essential facts about writing, about what works and what doesn't. And, and you know, all that we've talked about, how personal this is, there's, there's something that maybe needs to be said as a bit of a corrective to that, which is that, that words, Faulkner, talked about this a lot this was his metaphor i think building a chicken coop uh, you know words and sentences are a medium mm -hmm. whether you're working in poetry whether you're working in i mean obviously the medium has to be used differently but it's like it's materials they're the materials and just as you know you wouldn't try to build a skyscraper out of wood but as soon as you try it with concrete and rebar and you know you can build tall um, there are certain things that you can't do with certain kinds of poetry. There are certain things you can't do with certain kinds of sentences and approaches, narrative approaches that just don't work. And right. why don't they? Well, many writers, try. you can try, <laughs> but many writers have tried and failed. And, and when you're sitting at a magazine, you see those things come through, right? You see all right. those and they don't work. And we yeah. see again and again that they don't work. But if you're not around other writers, if you don't have that right. element of community with an MFA or, or some other means, then you'll really miss that until you yourself fail at each of those things. And that's a an exhausting type yeah. of process could be. I mean, imagine, imagine a self-taught surgeon or a doctor, like, do you, can you even imagine one? It's right. like, right. And yet, so, so my dad's a surgeon and I mean, it is, I, I've watched him train people over my whole life and they are artists. It is a tremendous art yeah. and there is nothing. I mean, it is not a science. It, I mean, it, it has elements of science, but it is such a beautiful art. And yet, as you just as you say, if you don't know how to use your tools, if you don't know the materials, if you don't know the difference between bone and skin and different kinds of tissue in the body, you will not be a good surgeon, period. <laughs> You're kind of <laughs> but Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I guess artists like this, like being like this idea of being special but it's like it's just as any other work <laughs> right right so the question of inspiration i mean it does have to happen that as you're working you hit a spark and something happens that you couldn't expect and on you go right in in a yes. new territory yeah. that you might not you feel it but you might not even realize what you've done until you know months later when that spark dies out and you finish this project uh you you see what happened and you almost don't remember when you shifted over but that's why so many stories you know you lop off the beginning or there's so much throat clearing that goes on when you start an essay yeah you, yeah oh right, for sure for quite a while and then then su suddenly it takes off and you get a trusted reader to look at it what does that reader say that's like by page three you are really you're on yeah yeah i i guess it's it's again part of all all forms of writing um even billy i think billy collins say this very famously that just remove the first hands of your poems and then see how it works because of the same throat clearing like remove the first paragraph of a short story remove the first couple of pages and see where it's going yeah Absolutely. because so so what that means like if you're if you want inspiration to come and so therefore you go shopping or you take a walk or something well <laughs> you're you're not letting inspiration come because you're not saying yes. it work <laughs> it only yes it will only come when you sit down and write and clear your throat for a while before you start singing yeah yes and that's, that's beautiful um, yeah, I, I didn't even want to speak about inspiration, but I'm so glad we did. <laughs> As in, I hadn't planned that we were. Uh, I was like, you mentioned earlier when we were speaking about the MFA that it has now become a credential and a very big one in the US, especially, and it has. So I was thinking if, um, do you think that having an MFA or having that credential kind of ups one's odds for getting their work published? Like what factors you think publishers, and I'm not just speaking of lit mags, but also beyond that, 
indie publishers or whatever they consider when they are looking at um, debut poets, especially because you know, yeah. I I find it very hard to answer when it comes to magazines because I know that here it it as a credential would make next no. to no difference. I mean, we're reading the work. Um, that doesn't mean it makes no difference because in the end, you know, you know, when you're reading a poet who's read other poets, who's been around other poets, who's, you know, yes. has a community, but is that an MFA? Who knows? Right. 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 It could be, it could come by another means for some people. Absolutely. But um, when it comes to, I think if, if somebody as a debut poet has published poems in 12 really good magazines, and then they go to a publisher with their manuscript. The publisher isn't going to say, good Lord, you publish in great places, but we're not that interested because I don't see an MFA on this list. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. I think, you know, you would have, if you have an MFA and you go to a poetry press with your poems and a beautiful manuscript and none of them have been published in journals, they're That's... not going to look at you very closely. Right, right, right. right? And so the, the bias is not going to be sort of the fulcrum point is not really going to be the MFA at that level. Yeah. It's going to be uh, editor's attention in magazines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I came to Blacksburg for my MFA at VT because Bobby Cock lives here, who mm -hmm. I've told inspiration is my most favorite poet ever. And he did not even have a BA, but he published in all the big mags because his work was good and still is. Uh, he got a book he he had published i think three books before he got an offer to teach just based on those books he didn't have a ba and mfa or whatever and he got a like a special mfa or something like an honorary mfa or a lores he did it after he had published those books so that's kind of an anomaly i guess in our field in some way but i i see that how that alone says that it's more important to have your work been seen by editors and um, well published. So ben in Burkert's my co-editor here. He has a bachelor's degree. He does not have a master's degree. He has umpteen, I think, is the exact number of books. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and he was the director of the Bennington MFA program by the yeah. end of his. You know, yeah. that was the sort of last position he held there, um, and edited Agni has edited Agni for many, many years, um, which means that that he was, uh, you know, employed here at Boston University for a long time. Right. The, he didn't get an honorary MFA either. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, you know, Bennington, which has always been a college that's interested in, you know, practitioners above all, um, they even took some students and have continued to, as far as I know, that don't have undergraduate degrees and they take them for... Oh master's program um, right. because, because they look at their writing you know it should be only and ever and always about the writing yeah. Um, so yeah that's what i was saying in my head before yeah that if there are writers listening to this that it's the writing that matters more than anything else then it's the work that will speak to people and yeah get you yeah, but, but there's almost there's no culture i can think of or sort of that i have access to uh where mentorship is not factor or an important piece of part of life you know and and so if you think about the versions of schools you know in, in China 2,000 years ago in um, Greece 2,000 3,000 years ago 2,500 years ago <laughs> um, you like what you picture are these places where students would sit around in a circle I don't know why outside but outside yeah. what I picture, <laughs> yeah. and, and there is the sage right and I think if you're not sitting with writers who've reached points in writing that you haven't yet, right. by your right. own lights, like by your estimation, they've reached things that you haven't reached, then you need to find a way to do it. Because, because that's, how, that's how things are passed down in every field, in every endeavor. Um, and, and it's so much true, so true in writing. Writing is such a complex thing that mm -hmm. you need to... You know, one of the, um, Charles Baxter has mm -hmm. an essay in his craft book, uh, Burning Down the House, where he talks about, I'm forgetting who his teacher was, but he talks about 
the the problem and the opportunity of the writer's toolkit. You know, you go to an MFA program and you're encouraged by many of these professors to Very my apologies. <laughs> you're encouraged. My... <laughs> no, I just wanted to buy something. No, no. Um where was I? Uh oh. <laughs> we'll have to cut out this section. Yeah, no, <laughs> no worries. Uh Charles Baxter is speaking about Yeah, yeah. Uh... Um you're you're encouraged by many professors to kind of imitate them, right? I mean, sometimes to a fault. Yes. They, they say you should never do this and you should always do that. And when you do it, you you write stories that sound a lot like theirs or you write poems that, you know, use their moves. And, yeah. and if they don't write any narrative poetry, then you're mm -hmm. only writing the the short oh, poems that they write or, you know, yeah. but, but there's something that he says that's quite beautiful about that. If you throw yourself into it and you learn what their toolkit is, how it's constructed, and, and and watch what it achieves. Like, wow, I really do suddenly sound like that writer. Mm -hmm. Then you can make you get out of that program and you start to assemble your own toolkit. Toolkit, okay. yeah. Yeah, and you say like, ah, wait, if I do this, then I sound like myself to me. Right, right. And if yeah. I if I do that, I kind of don't, even though that's perfectly good. It just yeah. doesn't sound like me. So now my toolkit has this and that. Yeah. Um, so you learn how a toolkit is constructed. How in the world else would you learn that other than a lifetime of work um, without yeah. working with a writer who's who's sort of built one? Uh, yeah, I've in my head, I've always been um, a fan of imitation <laughs> in that sense. Because that's how you know what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And then you also change as you imitate. Like, you know, this example works so well for me, this analogy. Like, if I like, like, these five writers so much, and if they each have, like, say, 10 tools, and I borrow each of them, like, at different points, and I have 50 tools that I can, like, pick and choose from and make my own kind of tool set of 10 or whatever, that I, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great. And that shows that a lot of this, you know, can be done through our reading it can be done through our you know own sort of attachments as readers um but i can tell you i mean i went through undergrad not going to writing programs and i took a different single author course every semester so i was really soaking in careers as it were i mean going back to chaucer yeah. and yeah so on, but and then i wrote for years and years and years and years and what i learned from being in a community of writers First at Vermont Studio Center, mm -hmm. which is how I really knew I needed to be around other writers. That was in 1998, um, and then finally in, um, and then finally in an MFA program. I just it it it's as if in two years I had leapt forward by another 13 of of the years you know of of the old dispensation you know how i how i thought i was making progress and teaching myself um it just yeah. yeah there's no substitute for that but i but i hesitate to say it's mfa you know that's right. that's needed it, it's mentorship it's, that's yeah, needed. It's, yeah 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 and community feel, mentorship and community yeah i feel that that's like in workshops i often have this feeling that it's it's not as useful as a one-on-one -on -one mentorship is even with the same professor that I'm in a workshop, I would feel a very different kind of kind of um, back and forth in a one-to-one -one meeting. Because if you're offering somebody your work who really knows you and your work, the way they can treat your work would be very different than a group of writers who maybe you don't care about or they don't care about you, you don't know that well. It just it's just a random bunch of like suggestions that will just mess up your poem or your, I don't know, essay. <laughs> totally, totally agree. I mean, yeah, you, you don't know those other writers enough to know what their advice uh, means. And I mean, yeah. you, you do have to, over time, come to understand what your various mentors advice means, right? You have to be able to filter that too. Right. Because there are some things they told you not to do that later are going to be the center of what you do. Okay, right. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. yeah, as has happened many, many times. <laughs> the, yeah.
I love this. Thank you for doing this. I oh, it's, thank you. That's it's great fun to talk with you. Yeah, likewise. There's one last question that I have. It's gonna go back to Agni. Um, so I wrote this down. I don't even know if you'd like to speak about it, but if you would, I'd love to hear. Um, so we see that the literary world is constantly evolving, or it is, I think, because of mostly because of social media, say, or um, and every every year, and as an essay comes, the novel is dead or whatever. It's been happening for a hundred years now. <laughs> so maybe it's not evolving, but for Lit Mags, I think it is uh, uh, because we are competing with a lot of entertainment, which is frankly speaking, way more entertaining um, than, you know, truly devoting your time. Like for instance, like a Taylor Swift song is like so much easier to listen to than, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, an Alvo part piece or whatever. Um, so, I imagine these con these conversations are part of the Agni team and meetings that, you know, how how are we kind of, how are we evolving um, as the world around us evolves? So if you have, like, how do you stay ahead of that curve of ever-changing kind of um, industry? Do you think about this? Is it a bother, <laughs> concern? <laughs> I'd say no. By and large, no, not a concern. Um, I mean, we all are inevitably involve evolving. We're we're, we're also involving. Um, <laughs> we are changed by what's happening in the world. I guess if I felt that, you know, it was a team of cloistered people and I was cloistered too, then I'd be worried. Um, but I don't think that the things that happen on social media should affect us very much at all. Um, not that we should be completely unaware of them, but, mm -hmm. but there is something about literature that, I mean, I love reading books that are still burbling to the top of my need after 10 years, you know, not books that came out yesterday. Yes. And so we don't want to be a magazine that's great to read tomorrow, but in 10 years feels like uh, it was trendy or it was attached to things that were uh, kind of momentary flashes of beauty or, or interest. Um, I agree with you that, that in some ways, it's easier to listen to a pop song um, than to a more engaging or challenging piece. But I also think that this is partly about how we how we train ourselves. What, you know, yeah. what do you really? I I can't sit with just I can't sit with a genre mystery novel. I mean, there are mystery novels that are written at the highest skill and art, but. Um, but just a, you know, a series genre mystery novel, I can't do it um, because all the things that I care about engaging with are missing there. Um, and so, you know, does that mean it's a problem if somebody loves to go read those on the beach? No, of course not. But it's not the same thing they're doing when they pick up, you know, the Benjamin Labatut's When We Cease to Understand the World, which is just such a freaking phenomenal yeah. book. Um, yeah. And that to me is more entertaining it's more, well, if, if we use that word to mean more absorbing, it engages mm -hmm. me more with the deepest parts of myself and, and the world. Um, and I want Agni to be that for each of us working on the magazine, you know, to, to fill that role, not the other. I, lo I love that. You give me so much hope. I, yeah, I think similar. I can't stand pop music. <laughs> That's what. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't say Taylor Swift because I don't really know that many Taylor Swift songs, so I don't know how easy they are to listen to. <laughs> I, they might drive me nuts pretty quickly. She's probably the most popular person on earth right now. Oh, I, so, yes, I agree with that. My, um, no, I mean, there's certainly there's there's plenty of pop music that has and and plenty of her music. I'm sure that that has real skill and you know. Oh, for but, if, yeah, for sure. But it doesn't. But by and large, you want to find those, you know, even like the bands that I've loved that hit that hit it big at some point in their careers. Like it's almost always the side stuff they did either early or along yeah. the way. They put out an album that wasn't so big. And that's the one that I'm that, always. That is so true. I yeah, I'm the same way, too. That's so true. But again, once again, I love that answer. I love that we train ourselves in ways and we also cultivate an audience that also learns to appreciate what's what takes more engagement and what challenges them yeah th that's totally our goal at only bombs to to kind of uh not <laughs> thank you to not to not to not take it easy and to not like just cater to what's happening in this moment and you know it's it's like you said i almost never read books that are published this year i'm always reading like way into the past so
Thank you. Thank you so you much. Know, support, but, but you're also supporting writers who are writing now. And I think that combination is essential. You know? Oh, for, yeah. So you're giving because, a platform to writers right. who are writing now. Yes. Because literature, writers, literature will not be there for us, you know, in 10 <laughs> years when we're looking for the things written 10 years yes. ago. It's now. This is this is like these people who are young and like writing today are like those bands in their early days, so exactly. to speak. Yeah. These are going to be our greatest hits. <laughs> they're yes. writing now. And I could be proud of it. We were the first people who published this giant author who's now won this major book award or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's it's so gratifying to do this. You s spoke about this in the beginning to talking to a person and talking to the writer and like, it's so intimate and I just love, love this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're giving me a lot of hope. So <laughs> I mean, I just love knowing that there are, uh, and I, I do know, and now from you also, that there are people starting magazines that have this kind of goal and energy and, um, you know, expanding. That's what Oscold did in 1972, you know, yeah. and it needs to happen in 2022, 2024, <laughs> 2026. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it means so much to me. And um, yeah, that's it, I guess. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for asking me to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. I'll see you soon again. Hopefully. Okay. Nice. Have you, have you <laughs> Cheers, Bill. Bye. Cheers. Have a good rest of the day. You too.